Good evening. Welcome to St. John this evening. It is uh, our observation of the feast that actually falls tomorrow, which is St. Peter and St. Paul. It seems weird to have them both on the same day, but uh, we'll talk about that actually in the sermon. Our order of service it follows service one, which is on page 151, so you'll need that. And uh, everything else that changes apart from the, the one hymn is on your white sheet. So keep that handy and you'll be good. Let's stand, we'll begin our service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and have done, and by what we have done. We have Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Exalt in your name all the 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful and eternal God, your holy apostles, Peter and Paul, received grace and strength to lay down their lives for the sake of your Son. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit that we may confess your truth at all times and be ready to lay down our lives for him who laid down his life for us even Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading for the Festival of St. Peter and St. Paul. It's from Acts chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done done through them among the Gentiles. After they had finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The Lord of hosts is with us.
is from Galatians chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seemed to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, also worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. Only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We sing our hymn of the day, six. 147, or Jesus Christ, the church's head, 647.
In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today we celebrate the festival of St. Peter and St. Paul. These men were called to be apostles, but were often radically distinct from each other and at odds. So both of them get their own days on other days of the year. The confession of St. Peter on January 18th and the conversion of St. Paul on January 25th. Even those festivals are only a week apart, these two great pillars of the church. Despite their disagreements, the church has taken great pains to show that these two apostles share one confession in one Lord, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And so tomorrow, and today, I guess, on June 29th, we celebrate these men together. There'll be some more background information for you if you want to read the sounder tomorrow, tell you why this feast day is on this day. But we heard two readings, and I think we ought to take some time to reconcile the two. There's actually, it seems, some distinction between the account given by Peter by way of St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles of that Jerusalem council, Acts 15, and also the account given then by Paul to the church in Galatia in Galatians chapter 2. We did hear what the source of the controversy was about. So Paul, if you know, had circumcised Timothy, who was, of course, a Jew, uh, raised by his mother and uh, mother Eunice, right, and Lois, who was his grandmother. So he had been circumcised, as, even as a Christian. Um, but Titus, on the other hand, as we heard, Paul did not circumcise, and this caused no end of controversy even uh, wherever Paul was, because very often the first to convert to the Christian faith, the confession of Christ, were the Jews. And as with any kind of strongly held tr tradition or practice, they die hard. <laughs> they don't go away, not easily, even if they have now been abrogated and eliminated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we heard about all the ceremonial laws of Moses, and even James, in his uh, farewell speech there at the end of the council said, well, they should still keep some of the laws of Moses, if not circumcision, you know, fasting from, uh, uh, from blood and certain meats and this sort of thing. But the center point, the central controversial point was at that point of circumcision, which was the chief mark of one being part of the old covenant. Remember, it was given first to Abraham. And it was instantiated for all the people of Israel under Moses from Sinai. So then the question is, what about Christians? Now, I suppose we could talk about all the medical um, questions that surround circumcision, whether it's good or bad, and what's you, what they use the, the cutting for and all of that. But here, that circumcision mark was put at the very point where the promised Savior would come by way of the fathers and then their sons. So the promise given to Abraham and then to Isaac and to Jacob was of an offspring, a son, the same son that was promised to Adam and Eve, the son that would crush the serpent's head. So they were always looking forward to their sons. Perhaps this son is the son of the, that would be the Messiah. And especially as we come to David and the promises repeated to David of a son who would reign as king forever, whose throne would be eternal. Again, David looked to his sons to be the fulfillment of that promise, Absalom being quite the disappointment, Solomon being the one of the lineage of Jesus. And so circumcision was pointing forward to Jesus. But now that Jesus has come, it is no longer necessary. Salvation has come. And there, Jesus actually inst institutes a new covenant, a covenant or a testament in his blood. The blood shed at his cross, given to us to drink in the supper, washed upon us in our baptism, that blood that forgives us our sins. And so circumcision was no longer necessary, at least not religiously speaking, and not mandated for Christians. And as Paul was working among the Gentiles, he didn't even bother having them circumcised then. Why would they need to submit to this sign of a covenant that has been fulfilled in Jesus? And never mind all the rest of the laws of Moses. So, some taught that unless you are circumcised according to the 
custom of Moses, you cannot be saved, as we heard, Acts 15.1. So this caused no, no small dissension, according to St. Luke, among the apostles and the pastors, or the elders as they're called, Paul and his companions, whether it's Barnabas or the others. So they have a council, and this is what you do when there is a dispute, whether it is over doctrine or practice. The church gets together, and they, well, they try to hash it out. So Peter and the rest of Jerusalem called Paul and Barnabas to give an account of their experiences. The first point that they need to demonstrate to the council is that the work that they're doing is according to God's mandate and design. And so Paul gives testimony to the way that uh, the Gentiles had received the word of the gospel, were converted, were baptized, and had received the Holy Spirit just as they had. Clearly, God was at work amongst Paul with his companions. Even these non-believing Pharisees got involved in the council, demanding that they submit, Christians submit to the law of Moses. But you'll remember what Paul said and asserted was what actually saved the Gentiles. It was by hearing that Jesus Christ was crucified for the forgiveness of their sins. They were saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. And believing, they were baptized and received the Holy Spirit, just like the pillars of the church, that was James and Cephas and John, had received at Pentecost. Paul makes this really dramatic assertion when he says that there is now no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And elsewhere, he'll say, between the circumcised and uncircumcised, even between slave and free, but that Christians are saved by faith in Jesus' saving blood alone. But that's mostly all given to us from Peter's account in uh, Luke's Acts of the Apostles. Paul adds more background from his account to the when he writes to the church in Galatia. He tells us that he had been working amongst the, Galatians, amongst the Gentiles, I should say, for 14 years. But during that time, false Christians had infiltrated the church. A practice that's hard to hear is possible, but it, it did, and it does even today. They come in by stealth, and what, what is their objective? What, what might we be on guard for? They spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us again into bondage. There's nothing more offensive to the old Adam than the freedom of the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, as far as a religious offense would go. The old Adam, the flesh, wants nothing to do with a gift and wants everything to be about work. Whether it's merit or demonstration of faith or all the different manifestations. Bondage, slavery, do this, do that, and you'll be saved. Instead, here comes Paul saying, you are saved by grace, God's giving alone. And he even gives you the faith to believe it. All as gift. Freedom, not bondage. So this really isn't an insignificant matter. Paul really gets after the heart of it. It's not just about some external practice about circumcision or even just the language of Old Covenant and New Covenant. And maybe you can kind of have a halfway position where you do the laws of Moses and you believe in Jesus or something. Well, that's not possible. This was not an insignificant matter. He says that these are, to coin a phrase, theological terrorists who were trying to undermine the freedom of Christ's forgiveness by demanding that Christians submit again to the law of Moses. And so he said, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we could bear? Now it's not circumcision or uncircumcision that's the point. Paul had already treated that as an indifferent matter in regards to both Titus and Timothy, one circumcised, the other not. But the gospel of forgiveness in Jesus is attached very specifically to preaching, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. And that's the thing that matters. The law, the preaching of do this and you will live, the law of Moses, Paul rightly says was a yoke that we couldn't even bear. It always accuses. It always shows us our sin. It never sets us free. It only puts us further and further under bondage. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness is true freedom. 
So now I think Paul rightly recognizes that the conflict isn't just over a matter of what meats we eat or which laws we follow or whether we do this medical procedure that was a sign of something in the past. Paul rec rightly recognizes the conflict is between faith and unfaith, believing and unbelieving. As Paul tells us, for God who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. See, circumcision and uncircumcision isn't the thing. It's God working through his chosen instruments to preach the gospel, to deliver sinners from their sin and into the freedom of Christ. So he demonstrated the conversion of the Gentiles as they heard the word of the gospel, were baptized, received the spirit. And so James, Peter, or as he was called there, Cephas and John, extended the right hand of fellowship and endorsed his work to the uncircumcised Gentiles. Notice they, he didn't stay long in Jerusalem, though. They probably still didn't get along all that well. Maybe we're even a little suspicious of Paul, given his background. But this is the only way for anyone, and I would say even for our Christian congregation, even amongst individual Christians, to reconcile. It's not to just agree to disagree, not to ignore the differences, not to set them aside and forget or act as if they don't matter, but rather to drill down and find what, well, what truly does matter, to speak frankly and openly about what we believe, and then to determine, is this practice contrary to what we confess, or does it support what we confess? Can it be set aside, or is it something that Jesus actually instituted that we must do in order to be saved, like baptism, for example. Have that conversation and reconcile. So as we put all these accounts together, and maybe even add some other experiences, like the one that Peter had, remember where there was that cloth or that curtain that came down from heaven, it was a vision, and on it were all sorts of animals, and Jesus told Peter that there was now no distinction between clean, unclean and clean foods which Peter rightly understood meant that there was now no distinction between Jew and Gentile. We can see that there really then is no great divide between the ministry of those pillars of the church, James, Peter, and John, and Paul. Or even just between the two that we recognize this day, Peter and Paul. Not so different after all, despite their backgrounds, despite um, who they were sent to minister to, they actually share one confession, one faith. After their larger-than-life egos and their old grudges, their dead traditions, and even that heavy dose of skepticism about Paul, that former persecutor of the church, after all that was set aside, they finally found agreement in the preaching of the law and the gospel faithfully and the giving of the gifts of Jesus as he has instituted them. And of course, that is what they determined at the Jerusalem Council for us, still our confession today, that we agree on the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments, that's all that is necessary for true unity in the church. Everything else, well, it's window dressing. And thus, we can celebrate these two men together, these two apostles, one to the Jews and the other to the Gentiles. And as tradition has it, they were both interred beneath the original St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And now together they await the joyous resurrection that they fearlessly proclaimed together. May God give us the same sort of faith that we can reconcile in Christ, majoring in the mi not in the minors, but in that which Jesus has given. The confession of the gospel and forgiveness that it gives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand. We confess our common Christian faith and show love for one another by confessing together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 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 the Holy
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O God, our Father, who didst establish thy household, the Church, upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles, Jesus Christ, thy Son, being the chief cornerstone, we thank thee for the most glorious ministry thou didst give unto thy servants Peter and Paul, whom you didst deliver from darkness into thine ineffable light, and who under the guidance of thy spirit renounced the works of the law for the righteousness which is by faith in Christ, expounded thy word in the fullness of truth, and preached Christ crucified as the only Savior of men. We praise thee that thou didst call and ordain them for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. We thank thee that, thou, that they wearied not in their mighty labors, but empowered and strengthened by thee, when troubled were not distressed, when perplexed were not in despair, when persecuted were not forsaken, when cast down were not destroyed, so that bearing in their bodies the marks of Christ's death, they also made manifest his life and the victory which overcomes the world. Grant unto us, O God, the same faith that, continuing steadfastly in their doctrine, preserved for us in the Holy Scriptures, we may be delivered from sin's gall of bitterness and the bondage of, to death and the devil, and be raised to newness of life in the love, grace, and power of Christ. Increase that faith day by day in our hearts. Give us the assurance that nothing in this world can separate us from thy mercy in him. And help us so to walk in obedience to his commandments that, whether present or absent in the flesh, we may be accepted of him. Uphold and defend thy church, the steward of thy mysteries, that it may ever be found faithful. Deliver it from the hands of its enemies and keep it from lukewarmness and indifference. Save it from the temptations that attend prosperity and ease. Make it to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Give it deep concern for all thy children everywhere and unceasing prayerfulness for those of the brethren who are oppressed and persecuted. Let thy servants go forth to prophesy to the nations and open doors for them in every land, that thy name may be hallowed and thy kingdom come. Be pleased to visit our country with thy mercy and let the light of thy word shine forth into all our homes so that they may obey thy voice and amend our ways and not come under thy judgments. Destroy all works of iniquity and prosper the endeavors of those who labor for righteousness' sake. And as thou hast called upon thy people to lift up with holy hands the needs and wants of all men, we pray for all who are overshadowed with the clouds of suffering, sorrow, or peril, and beseech thee to grant unto, the, unto them thy merciful aid, that they may be delivered from all evil and live to sing thy praise. Now, unto him who, with his apostles, was appointed unto death and made a spectacle unto the world and before men and angels, but whom thou didst exalt by thy power to sit in heavenly places, even thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to him be glory and dominion and majesty forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to greet one another with the peace of Christ. What shall I render to the Lord 
for all his benefits to me. I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O Jerusalem. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, for you have mightily governed and protected your holy church, in which the blessed apostles and evangelists proclaimed your divine and saving gospel. Therefore, with patriarchs and prophets, apostles and evangelists, with your servants, St. Peter and St. Paul, and all with the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of born and white, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, 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 not in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna on him, the highest. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, 
which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God.
let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.